so this is everyone that comes to these says that we need more time to, for questions we need more time to hear the scholars talking amongst themselves so we're going to have them sit here and we, this is entirely unrehearsed and even unoutlined so this is your chance to sort of think about what you've been hearing so last night you know professor levine talked about the cultural milieu which out of which roosevelt comes and roosevelt's sort of intense and widespread interest in the culture of of the the transition between the 19th and the early 20th century and today hal cannon who can talk about much more than than the subject that he did but uh, but roosevelt's particular honing in on cowboy poetry cowboy tradition cowboy song and being not only a, um, a discerning student of it and having theories of it, but being a patron to a man uh, like John Lomax. And now we've just heard this splendid account of Roosevelt's life as a reader. So this makes this symposium different from any other that we've done, and I think extremely valuable. And so thank you for that. But, but this is your chance now to ask questions of any or all of our presenters about things that you've been thinking about since they spoke or things you want them to talk about amongst themselves. So who would like to begin? Yes, here. That's a great question. The, the way in which these people like Remington and Wister and Lomax and Roosevelt helped to create the, what we're going to call the myth of the West, or our idea about cowboys in the West. How intentional was this? I think they're on. But Hal, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about is, you know, Roosevelt does say in several of his books, this is an ephemeral moment in American history. He was very conscious of Frederick Jackson Turner's uh, frontier thesis that the, in, in which, in 1893, in which Frederick Jackson Turner said, with the closing of the frontier as a formal census categorization, thus ends the first great phase of American history. And Roosevelt said that the open range cowboy or ranch was going to be would disappear as the Grangers came in and, and did homesteads but you've been for more than 30 years um, presiding over a group that believes that didn't actually happen that this wasn't ephemeral well yeah I mean one thing I said today was that uh, how strong Roosevelt's belief was in romance mm -hmm. and the right to have romance and uh, romance is always ephemeral and I, you know, I think part of the story is uh, that you know we catch it when we can. And they they were catching a moment in history with Toe Vigor, and uh, all all three of those men did that. I, you know, Lomax I don't think was in that same category. Um, he was a little bit of an outsider. I think his message of collecting the authentic voice of cowboys was welcome but it wasn't part of what they were doing particularly. I think we benefited from it, but they saw it as more uh, uh, a literary exercise in the past and uh, a way to look at the sort of this continuity of tradition that went from the middle of time. Um, but, you know, that, that question about the vanishing cowboy is a, 
is an interesting one, and we keep saying it over and over again. I mean, there's still documentaries being made today. The last cowboy, the last this. The, the, there was a, a great documentary about the last uh, season on, on a Montana sheep ranch mm -hmm. that was very popular a couple of years ago. And, um, and I think we need to do that, but the fact is is that we keep reinventing uh, this life and this romance and this uh, ability to take uh, great value from a life on the land. And it's not just an American thing. But at the gathering, you lots of different people speak. They, they give little prefaces before they recite their poems or sing. And over and over again, you get a kind of cultural militancy that says, this is an endangered way of life, government is against us, the urbanization of American culture is against us. If we don't self-consciously embrace this thing and perpetuate it, that it will be lost. I mean, there's something deeply rooted in the ephemeral, in the very idea of cowboy culture, isn't there? Right, there is. But, you know, the, the, the statistics really are towards maybe not vanishing, but getting smaller and smaller all the time. But the, you know, at Jefferson's time, what, 90% of people were yeoman farmers and such, and at the, at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, about 50% of Americans were, and now what do we have, 2% two, two right. or so? So, you know, it's, uh, it, is, it is a smaller number. There's smaller cattle herds out there. Uh, there's less people doing that work, uh, more mechanization. But no, people are very fiercely, uh, fiercely hold on to the idea that this is a vital life and it's still on, it's ongoing. And Stephen, one thing that strikes me as so interesting is how this thing that, that, that Hal and Roger are talking about, this one aspect of Roosevelt, the, the romance of the West, let's call it, uh, is just one part of his much larger cultural embrace and as you were saying last night I mean he, he's doing high culture and popular culture he's doing European culture and American culture uh, were there people that you know of who were hard on Roosevelt for having this interest in Western cowboy culture I, I don't see much evidence of that but I, I've always been perplexed to an extent by how Roosevelt lived in so many worlds you mentioned Wagonex book the seven worlds of Theodore Roosevelt that was one of the early works I stumbled upon as well. And it really shows well, ever published in the 50s maybe, I'm going on memory, um, around in the 50s, really shows the many facets of Roosevelt, the many worlds in which he operated. But I haven't seen anything where there, there was tension. And of course, the, you could look at the Rough Riders, for example. Look at the composition of the Rough Riders. Right? There are academics in there, there are athletes. Um, uh, intellectuals, just an incredible mix, and he seemed to navigate those various worlds very well, very effectively. And I think, to answer your question, I don't think there was much criticism, maybe because he was such a strong personality, but I don't think many of them were critical of him, you know, say an academic being critical that he was also a boxer, for example. I haven't found any of that, and I certainly haven't seen Roosevelt reflecting on that. I don't see this being a problem that Roosevelt at least identified as he, again, navigated and operated in these various worlds. Feel free to, to respond to each other as you do. Other questions? Yes? Well, what impressed you a little on his religious sensibility? Um, can you make a comment first? If you're going to stand up and speak to the audience, so I don't try to paraphrase right. it. So there's more scripture than one might think because it's not so much direct quotation as an absorption of, of certain parts of the scriptural message. Anyone want to take that? I would just say that 
I don't think that suggests any higher level of religiosity. I just think Roosevelt was engaged with the Bible as he was with hundreds, if not thousands, of other texts and, in, and sort of employed them in his own thoughts and his own writing. So I don't know if that speaks to what you said, but I, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think it suggests that he was religious or that he thought it had any sort of divine function, <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. A man of little religion. But it, I'm sure that's true. Uh, but you know, he's constantly actually mentioning characters out of Dickens. It's astonishing how often Roosevelt talks about a character from Dickens as if every rational person had read David Copperfield or knew Little Dorrit and. It's, it's just assumed in his mind that the person he's writing to knows Dickens as well as he does, which is probably more true then than now. But he seldom says, in the book of Luke there is this, or in the book of Exodus there is that. He's always, he's pretty chapter and verse specific about his reading, isn't he? Oh, you're asking me? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it, it's hard to, to uh, answer that because in cases where he isn't specific or where he's just borrowing and not attributing, uh, I could well read something of his and never know it. Fantastic, <laughs> yeah. So I would only know the things that he actually attributes. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, there's this famous story that when he was in Egypt, you know, he visited this very important mosque in Cairo. And he asked about a particular book that was written by a Muslim uh, who had traveled in um, around Africa in uh, around the 1200s, I believe it was. And the, the, um, the uh, elders there at this mosque were so impressed with his knowledge that they gave him a copy of the Koran. And it was the first time they'd ever given an, a non-Muslim a copy of the Koran. And so you, you can't help but think, well, he probably read that, you know. But d does he quote from it? <laughs> you know, did he use it in his writing? I wouldn't know. <laughs> you know? And it, it, it's that sort of thing. I, he seems like a sponge that just absorbed uh, information. And, um, and we know even today that politicians oftentimes use texts without attribution. <laughs> so Certainly not. Least, you know? Yes, here, please speak up. Roosevelt and Bill Sewell. Roger, I think that's a question oh, yeah. for you. Yeah, sure. Um, he and Sewell were, were great friends. You know, Sewell was more or less the, the frontier archetype that Roosevelt, I think, wished he had been. He was the first, uh, if I remember correctly, the first white child born in Aroostock County in Maine uh, back in the 1840s. And like Roosevelt, he'd been sickly as a child, but he grew into this big strapping guy who was like over six feet tall and, um, uh, you know, a powerful man, a logger. Um, someone who really knew the wilderness. He was a hunting guide. And of course, Roosevelt wouldn't know this, but he lived into his 80s. Um, and Sewell was a, a great fan of Theodore Roosevelt's. Uh, when Hagedorn wrote his book, uh, Roosevelt told Sewell, uh, you know, I'm sending this man Hagedorn to talk to you. Uh, tell him anything you want, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Tell him everything. But it was a really safe bet because um, ha uh, Sewell had once said that he thought Theodore Roosevelt was the greatest man since Jesus and maybe since before. <laughs> so they, they were uh, very good friends. Now Sewell, I think, was less enchanted with the West than, than Roosevelt was. And when they came out here, Sewell said, I don't think this is good cattle country. You know, I think you're putting your money at risk. And Roosevelt was rather miffed by this idea. But Sewell, in fact, proved to be correct. And Sewell left here just before the uh, big blizzards came in and, and wiped out everything. And, uh, but they were very close friends. They can, and I've read a lot of their letters that they wrote to one another when Roosevelt was president. And Roosevelt would write Sewell, uh, you know, his political opinions and uh, what he thought about getting into World War I and what he thought about other politicians and so on. And I was really impressed with the uh, bond that formed between them. Roosevelt first met Sewell, if I remember, when he was about 19 years old and a student at Harvard. And he went hunting in Maine and Sewell was his guide. And I visited Sewell's house, and his great-granddaughter now ha runs it as a um, kind of a, of a yoga retreat. And uh, she has a lot of uh, letters that Roosevelt wrote to Sewell. And I, I didn't see those. She seemed to have misplaced them when I was there. But, um, but they were around. I don't think she lost them or anything. And um, 
you know, so, so Roosevelt established that friendship with Sewell and it maintained it throughout his life. And R Sewell was always trying to get uh, Roosevelt to visit Maine, though it was hard for him to get away. But he did have Sewell visit the White House. And when Sewell did visit the White House, Roosevelt put on his spurs. So Sewell heard him clinking down the hallways, you know, just like in the Old West. And uh, so they, but they, they were very close and genuine friends. And Roosevelt said, you know, his experiences in the West, he made friends of many people that he ordinarily wouldn't have encountered in his rather insulated uh, New York blue blood way of life. And uh, it gave him a great respect for the average man and, and the, the working man. And uh, he attributed much of that to his rise to political power. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine Roosevelt doing yoga, um, <laughs> which is kind of a fun thing to think about. <laughs> Strenuous yoga, yeah. militant yoga. Yeah. But I've read that book, and I've read Sewell's book. And Sewell's book is a very interesting yeah. text about Roosevelt. Yeah. But Sewell, like Merrifield, like others, like Jack Willis, mm -hmm. all of these memoirists who wrote about their friendship with Roosevelt, all have the same habit of saying they taught Roosevelt how to do X. Yeah. They're, they're constantly saying Roosevelt was just a greenhorn until I took him and did this with him. And Sewell does that a number of times in his book, and Willis certainly does in his. Willis a lot. Another question over here. Yes? Yeah, that's such an important question. We, we already started in on it, and there's probably no answer, but it's about whether Worcester and Roosevelt and Remington and others are correcting what they take to be misapprehensions of the life of the Granger or the cowboy, or are they burnishing something that they're, to use a cultural studies term, they're privileging a certain moment in American history or a certain um, labor style. So, it's, it, Hal, I want to start with you. It, it, it kind of is a question that you, one feels every time you go to cowboy poetry. It's the question of authenticity. So here's this picture of Roosevelt that he has taken in a studio in New York where he's had an authentic buckskin shirt made for himself and he's duded up. When he first gets out here, the, the actual working people out here are pretty skeptical of this guy because he's trying too hard to be authentic, proving that he's inauthentic. And so. Can you just reflect a little bit about the problem of authenticity in cowboy culture? Well, cowboys are, are, are great uh, critics of things that are inauthentic. inauthentic. And uh, uh, you talk to cowboys, and um, they, they, there's a lot of disdain for uh, Remington, for instance, in comparison to Charlie Russell. And, uh, you know, they say, look at the way he treats his horses. You know, I've heard cowboys say that, you know, they're, they're pulling the bit too hard and the saddle's not quite the way, you know, set correct, correctly. And uh, the narrative that Russell was telling from more an insider's perspective often is more appealing to cowboys uh, who are looking for their own kind of authenticity. Um, that's, and, I, and I'm not sure where all of that started. I just think, I think ranch culture has seen their life being usurped uh, and so they're quite protective of it and um, so while all of this is going on they're always looking with a critical eye to people who are coming and uh, being as they say duded up you know you walk to Jackson and say look at that guy with his cowboy boots outside his Levi's and you know, that sort of thing and cowboys are the first to be critics of that and I don't think that's new but it's still it's ongoing so what is it about that? Because I don't see farmers, you know, wheat farmers from Montana being edgy about the authenticity of their garb or their style or the way they speak. What happened in cowboy culture that it got locked into this heavy orthodoxy about what an authentic cowboy is and what he should wear or she should wear and the way they should speak and so on? There's, I mean, I'm sure Worcester played a role in this, but what is that, that kind of edginess. I, I think it's protective, really. It's sort of protective on being able to maintain your own voice, your own story, your own brand of uh, the heroic story. And, uh, and you know, I think people are won over. I, th I think Worcester won over a lot of cowboys, as, as did in the, uh, in, the, in the movie era, people like uh, Gene Autry and others. You know, they worked hard to please not only a larger American audience, 
but also to uh, to be authentic themselves. And, uh, and, and th I don't think the cowboys are the only ones that are looking for their authenticity. And I'm not sure exactly why the cowboy got relegated to that and um, the diesel mechanic didn't. Mm -hmm. Others on this? Now, I was just going to say, with Roosevelt, I don't think he was concerned. I, I, I think he admired people like Remington for sort of depicting this moment in American history that was being lost. I don't think he saw him as fixing or, you know, misperceptions of cowboys. I think it was more that he was sort of freezing this moment. And Roosevelt thought it was so essential because, of course, that's where Americans and Americanism was born on the West. So I don't think, again, he was, uh, saw them as uh, correcting misconceptions that Americans had about cowboys, about changing perceptions, just more about sort of holding on to that and the importance of that and portraying this very important episode in American history, this formative period in these formative people. Just wanted to add that, that's all. Other questions? Yes, here. So this, this is a question about the Eastern establishment and the Western experience, which is the title of that, that extraordinary book, and, that, and we've had that presenter here, but you know, the notion that Benjamin Harrison probably didn't think that the frontier thesis was important in the way that Roosevelt did, and Abraham Lincoln probably didn't even think in that same way. So what's the, what's the cultural tension here between the sort of the Turner people like Roosevelt, who think that the American experience is a dynamic that's born on the frontier, and then the Brahmins of Boston or New York and so on. I just want to make a quick comment, and I hope I'm not digressing, but I actually, I, I wish we could get Roosevelt up here on the stage, because I think this is one area in which he was very inconsistent. Uh, if you read volume one of Winning of the West, to me it's a lot like Turner. There's really, to me, there, there are many thinkers at the time. I think Turner just sort of pulled it together at the Columbian Exposition in, in a very well-packaged form. But I think those ideas about this formative experience with westward expansion, were, they were very uh, widespread um, at that time. But Roosevelt, of course, talks about the importance of the West as a formative period for uh, Americans and Americanism and even the American race, as he calls it. But at the same time, he also praises Robinson, who we just heard here and, and I mentioned in my talk, for um, talking about the authenticity of the, uh, the, the small town New England. That's just as American to Roosevelt as the West is. It doesn't really fit in with his thinking in terms of that it took the West to make Americans American. But I think it's there, and I think he was inconsistent. I would love to hear what he said, because he did praise Robinson, and this is just an example, for again, showing small town America. He believed New England, in other words, was just as American as those who were on the West and on the frontier. But it's not very consistent with his philosophy that Americans were born on the West, if that makes sense. I just think it was an inconsistency, something I'd like to hear him try to explain, at least. Well, I mean, but isn't part of it that in Roosevelt's time, we had the, the urban centers like Philadelphia and Boston and, and New York and so on. And then we had what was then called the middle border and the middle border is really our Midwest. It's Iowa, and it's Michigan, and it's Wisconsin, and to a certain extent, North Dakota. And it's pretty tame. Um, it's been tamed. It has the Masonic Lodge, and it has the school, and, and it has good roads and railroad access and so on. And then for Roosevelt and Worcester and Remington and others, there's the West with a capital W, which is sort of the last remnant of the old frontier. And it comes beyond the 100th Meridian, where the land is rugged and... and Jeffersonian agriculture doesn't really work. 
And so he can find in Vermont or New Hampshire the sort of the middle border country, rural America, or small town, John Hayes America, and that, that's authentic to him in a way that urban culture is not. I and mean, it's the urban culture that's the big loser in this, in this dynamic, right? That's right. Even though he, of course, was a New Yorker and very urban, and he was really Eastern, you know, Eastern intellectual sort of establishment, came from this very wealthy family. So, um, yes, I would agree, yeah. Over here. Oh, go ahead. Uh, raise one issue. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an academic nor an historian, but it does, you know, it did occur to me when we were talking earlier about, you know, Roosevelt and, and the West Side. Well, what about in the East? You know, there, there was a lot of uh, the same thing going on in the East. That's where I live. And, um, you know, there's a history there. And, of course, winning the West was about the, the old Northwest and the, the parts that we would think of as Eastern now. But what I wonder, it, when these people talk about the real American way of life in the West, I wonder if they're referring to the colonial roots because you look at the eastern seaboard and it's, it's not American in origin, it was, it was British. And it was British all the way to the Mississippi and then there were French, you know, and so on. And, but once you get west of the Mississippi, that's where things sort of begin with Americans, people who were post-revolution who, I'm just making this up as I'm going along here, so I don't even know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> but you have, so that you have this post-revolution uh, coterie of people going out into the West and settling the West. And those are true Americans. Those were people who weren't born under the colonial uh, British uh, form of government. And maybe that to those two people like Roosevelt, we have to remember that Roosevelt was born in 1858. He would have known people who were born in, in, uh, the, in the 18th century, uh, quite likely. And I think his grandfather was. And uh, it wouldn't have been that far removed from his time, the colonial era, so he could probably still feel that and still think in terms of, well, those, those people were somewhat British, you know, and they were somewhat Dutch, like he was. And um, it wasn't until they were Americanized and we had the United States, and then they went west. So the west is sort of distilled Americana. Um, that's, I'm just throwing this out as a possibility. I may, I may be you know, totally, I'm winging it, so I may be completely, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. In Winning of the West, uh, his magnum opus, his four-volume magnum opus, when he says West there, he means Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee. Exactly. He had intended to, to follow it further into the West, but he, he, he couldn't because of his political career heated up so much. But when he says the winning of the West, he means the Trans-Allegheny region mm -hmm. in the Ohio Valley, not the West as we currently think of it as Nevada and Utah. That's such a great question. So, I mean, the, the, these cowboys and Indians, he says a harem scarum group of cowboys and Indians that he gathers in San Antonio, and then they take the train to Tampa. But soon enough, they leave their horses behind. They become an infantry unit in Cuba. And the question is, what happens to their cowboy identity as they go into war? Who wants to take that? I can make up something. It <laughs> You're on a roll now. I always have an idea. <laughs> well, it occurs to me, you know, the Spanish-American War didn't last very long. So they weren't, didn't have that sort of milieu to immerse themselves in. And I think maybe it's instructive to look at World War I, where we had uh, Americans, you know, uh, you know, people from farming communities and small towns who were very regional in their way of thinking. They go over to Europe and they see this whole other way of life. And uh, you end up with the whole expatriate community thing going on after World War II and that sort of expansion of uh, the mentality of those people who went over there. And I'm thinking of you know, Ernest Hemingway and, and uh, that whole group of people, but also the folks who were in Berlin, uh, Christopher Escherwood and so on. And um, uh, their lives were changed by this. And we end up with a popular song called How Are You Going to Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? So I suspect that for the folks who went to the Spanish-American War, they weren't gone that long, so that maybe it never got into their blood, but certainly World War I suggests that there would have been some sort of dynamic going on that might have gotten them out of what were probably regional outlooks on things, because 
you know, in the, in the pre-automobile days, people were very regional in their thinking. You know, they, they tended to identify with their town or county rather than state or, or country. And uh, The brevity of that experience. Yeah, when may you have, look at them for the rest of his life, when Roosevelt had a parade or anything, the Rough Riders would show up. Mm -hmm. And they didn't show up in Cuban gear. They showed up yeah, as right. cowboys. I mean, they, yes. they, their cowboy identity survived and transcended their brief experience in, in, yeah. in the Caribbean. And, I, and I'm just wondering, you know, Cuba has always had an incredible romantic appeal to riders. Um, Badger Clark went to Cuba and got sick. But, uh, you know, a lot of people went to Cuba to well, for a Rome, Hemingway, of course. Uh, but and I'm not sure that started with the Rough Riders or it predated. predated. The Rough but tell us about Badger Clark. Not everyone knows about him. Well, Badger Clark was the poet laureate of South Dakota, right. and uh, went as a young man, a young writer, to Cuba, got sick, like a lot of people do, and went out west to recuperate in Arizona, and um, that's where he wrote most of his uh, best-known poems. Extremely popular uh, American cowboy poet. Uh, and uh, later in his life, he moved back to South Dakota. They had a cabin built for him on a state park, and he That's hung out. Park, right? yeah, hung out there and wrote poetry and hobnobbed with people. Uh, but his his beginnings as a writer really are in Cuba. I was just going to throw in something, if I may. Um, uh, if you know, again, the question of change and how moving from one region to another changes. We can look at Theodore Roosevelt himself who, you know, was very kind of a diehard Easterner, a Harvard fellow. He was a bit of a snob, really. You know, at Harvard, he, he thought about how he stacked up against other gentlemen students. He didn't really consider himself, you know, he, he wouldn't rate himself against, let's say, scholarship students, or whatever you want to call them, because they just weren't in his class, you know. And it wasn't until he went west that, that he changed and became less regional. And I think that itself informs us a little bit on that whole question about the Spanish-American War. And as to Badger Clark, um, he's... He's worth knowing, but if we were at the Cowboy Poetry Gathering now, there would be four people who would now recite a Badger Clark poem. It's so amazing how many poems the average cowboy poet has mastered at Badger Clark. It comes up often. Other questions here? Yeah, oh, lots back here. Go ahead. One of you. A row poem. He wrote his own books. Who edited them? Well, that's an interesting question because I know that John Cabot Lodge, you know, looked at some of his material, uh, some of the books that he was writing when he was out west. But those were the books on uh, political figures. Um, you know, I don't, I don't recall that ever reading that. You know, African Game Trails or something was reviewed by anyone he knew. But of course, anytime you do a book, there's a, an editorial process, and I'm certain it hasn't changed. So an editor at the publishing house would have gone over it. But did Roosevelt share his manuscripts with other people? And I don't know the answer to that. He does say in a letter that I just read the other day that he often read manuscripts to his wife while he wrote. And then Edith, who was a pretty severe critic, uh, would respond. And he sent, he, when he had the boat thieves here, when he arrested the boat thieves and brought them to justice and read Anna Karenina in French, he wrote a long article, I think for Century Magazine, about it and sent it to his sister, Bammy. And she said, if you take out about half of the I's and me's, this would be a much better article, uh, which he reluctantly did. Yeah. But I don't think that he—I don't think he had editors in the same sense that modern writers have editors. I think he was his prose passed pretty quickly to the printing press. Mm -hmm. But he did trust Henry Cabot Lodge, his wife Edith, his sister Bammy, and a few others to read some of his manuscripts. Yeah, I think his histories in particular would have benefited from huh. some further reading. I mean, I, he, he wrote a lot, but some of his history we would characterize as slapdash research, I would say. That, I know that might not be a popular thing to say here, but... Um, but think what he was doing. He went uh, for, for, for several of these books. He, w he had this incredibly busy life, including an incredibly busy travel life. This is an age before Xerox machines, and he would go to the... Uh, Pierpont Morgan Library in New York and spend the best part of every day for two months taking down copies of extracts from letters and from documents and then he would put all of those in a briefcase and carry them to the Badlands or carry them to somewhere 
on his honeymoon, on his second honeymoon, he wrote a large part of one of his books. He's constantly reading and he's constantly writing and he doesn't have any of the tools that we all take for granted. There's no Wikipedia, there's no internet, uh, there's no digital online uh, archive, there's no Xerox machine of any sort, and he wasn't hiring copyists to copy out these extracts. That's right. I would also add, look at his role models. For example, he loved Francis Parkman, and if you read those histories, I think Roosevelt's are a vast improvement over them, actually. They're, um, so I, I think we also have to consider when we, we interpret the style in which he wrote and how he wrote those books to look at the influences on him, what histories he read, particularly American historians, and Parkman's one of them. And you're preferring Roosevelt to Parkman? I, I am, actually. Even though you called Roosevelt slapdash. Uh, I, I think he was a little more balanced in his judgments than Parkman in yeah. many respects. But, he, but Roosevelt <laughs> himself admits that some of his books were very quickly, and he said, this book suffers from the haste with which that I wrote it and the fact that I didn't have access to more documents when I wrote it. That's right. And it's not just his histories. If I remember correctly, on his honeymoon, he wrote six articles. Right. I mean, he, pr he wrote, he was productive. And with that rate of production comes a little sloppiness. Forty books in a lifetime. Pretty good. Yeah. That, does that answer your question, Shyla? Yeah. Oh, good. Next one. Roosevelt's yeah. languages. Yeah, I actually can expand on that a little bit because I, I cut it out of my speech because I knew it was going to run long. But uh, yeah, he read in German, Italian, and, and French. Probably none of them very well. Um, he himself said his German wasn't very good, uh, though when he was a child it probably was because he spent, I think it was a year in Germany. In Dresden. Yeah, in, in Dresden. So he, he probably was better with German earlier in life. But he did apparently attend uh, some lectures given by a, a German pastor, and he was able to understand them as president. And, um, but his French uh, was apparently the language he felt the most comfortable with. But uh, from what I've read, he was very idiosyncratic in his use of French, and he didn't use articles, and he, he had a gleeful disregard for verb tenses and that sort of thing. And he said, basically, he spoke almost a sort of pigeon French, but apparently he was pretty fluent in it, and he could, he could be understood in it. Uh, but uh, John Hay, who was his Secretary of State, said that he spoke the most peculiar form of French he'd ever heard, you know. And he so, had Latin, he had good Latin, oh, Latin. both uh, Linnaean binomial Latin, and then he learned to read like Livy and Tacitus in Latin, and he had some Greek. So this was no slouch as a right. linguist. Yeah, I, I think his reading knowledge far surpassed his ability to produce, especially in French, and I would add, not only in terms of him not using articles in French, supposedly his accent was terrible. But, he, but you, he could be understood, but it wasn't real. I mean, he didn't sound like he was from France, let's just say that, when he spoke French. And his accent was terrible in English, too. So <laughs> going down that row, anyone else? No. Other questions? Yes. Was there an art component to the Country Life Commission? Not that I know of, know of but um, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Other questions? It's here. Yeah, what motivated Roosevelt to write 40 books? Well, I can yeah. throw in one comment was that he wanted to be a writer. I, you know, early on in his in his life, he was trying to decide, did I do I want to be a lawyer? And he, he really didn't. And uh, kind of like Worcester in, in that respect, uh, probably another reason they were good friends. But he early on decided he wanted to be a writer, and he started his first book while he was still a student at Harvard, which was the Naval Battles of you know 1812, which immediately became, even though it's incredibly hard to get through, he it became a big bestseller and was required reading in the British Navy for quite a number of years. And um, so he started out on, on a on a good footing. But I think it was, I think for him, writing was something he'd always wanted uh, to do. He was, early when he was trying to figure out what to do with his life, um, he thought for a time about ranching. But when he went to the West, part of what he planned to do out here was write. And uh, so I think, I think he really was a writer. You know, he was a politician and a writer. And uh, so naturally, writers write. He also needed the money. He says over and over again that he doesn't right. have any way to earn an an income. Right. And he was underpaid. I mean, our public servants were dramatically underpaid in that era. Uh, 
And so he's constantly saying, I have to keep writing these books yeah. because I'm going to need to develop an income that is right. somehow allows me to live the way I'm living. Right. That's why he was writing on his honeymoon. Uh, you know, he wrote something like six articles for Century Magazine while he was in Italy on his honeymoon, but it was because he felt he had certain debts he needed to meet. When he first married Edith, there, he was in some financial trouble. I mean, they were thinking about selling his favorite horse and so on, you know. And there's constantly saying they may need to sell Sagamore because they can't That's right. keep it up. Until he's president, he doesn't have a, a sufficient income. And, and even until, well, they really until the age of the 60s, former presidents were not permitted by custom to earn a living. And so this put every president up until our own time in a very difficult financial situation. There was no pensioning until uh, the 1970s. Other questions? We're going to, just a few more. Yes. So it's about the multicultural, multi-ethnic crucible in which these people wound up in Cuba. Thoughts? He said it was the most heterogeneous and democratic group of soldiers who had ever been assembled for any purpose whatsoever. So he was aware of this, and he was promoting this in the book that he wrote about it, The Rough Riders. And he, and he went to great lengths to pull together a wide variety of people in, for, for, for the Rough Riders. So he obviously thought that was important to be inclusive. I think there were a few, I'm going on memory here, uh, Native Americans yeah, in there, that. right? There were some Harvard buddies in there. Yeah. So it was quite a diverse group. So he obviously was very conscious about that. that didn't come together. So he, I think he saw that as, uh, I mean, of course, he wanted to get involved in the war before it ended. That was one of his primary concerns. But I also think he saw it as a level, a way, a way of leveling the playing field that all people could take part in. It was a very American activity to go and fight in the war. And let's get all kinds of Americans involved. I think he believes strongly in that. And Hal, I want to close with you, and then we'll go to lunch. But you use the word romance, and it's come up in several of the lectures here. He uses the word romance, I'm sure, more than any other president, certainly more than any that I know of. Talk a little bit more about what you think he means by romance. On the one hand, there's sort of the romance tradition of medieval literature and so on, but there's something bigger going on when he says romance. Well, uh, when, I, when I read quotes about romance, I, you know, I, I almost think of the word aspiration or things to, to uh, strive for, uh, you know, that are almost mythological in scope. And... Um, you know, I think all of these people we've been talking about, Remington and Russell, uh, or Whitster and, and Roosevelt, did aspire. I mean, they were they're big on an idyllic sort of a life, and that was the romantic vision that they held to. And that was a guiding force for them. And I, uh, I just think it was a powerful force, and he recognized it and articulated it, uh, whereas other people I don't think would. And... Um, you know, in a way, I ended talking about him having a great heart. I mean, the way he talks about romance, uh, you know, is, is a person of great heart who acknowledges people around him uh, over and over again. I just, I read these heartfelt ways that he expresses his gratitude to people and uh, the, the, just uh, the, the vivaciousness of, of his way of looking at the landscape and of, of the natural world. It's all um, 
it's all part of this sort of romantic vision of aspiring. So, you know, I wish we could go on and on. We'll have more chances, but I've so enjoyed this last piece here. It's so much fun to watch scholars talk to each other and slightly disagree with each other and, and add clarifications or bring things to each other that they might not have thought of at that moment themselves. But here's what I've been thinking all day, and that's North Dakota. I mean, we all know that Roosevelt said in 1910, I would never have been president of the United States had it not been for the time I spent in North Dakota. And we North Dakotans, of course, cherish and embrace that. And I think we're required to memorize that at birth. And, <laughs> but, but here's what I'm hearing, that North Dakota played this unbelievable role in shaping this man. So he comes out here when he's 24 years old. He comes out as this sort of dude. And then he becomes authentic and as, as you're saying, how his heart reaches out to these people, these singers and these poets and these common laborers and these hunters and woodsmen and so on. And he's, he's absorbing all of this. And it, it's not just one episode in his life. It sort of shaped his view of the heroic and the romantic and American possibility and the Turner thesis. So, I mean, it's, if you took out, this is going to sound like heresy, uh, but if you took out Harvard, Roosevelt might have been much the same person had he gone to Columbia, or even if he'd never been schooled at all. But if you took out North Dakota, we wouldn't be having this set of discussions that North Dakota was arguably the formative cultural creative moment in Roosevelt's life. Is that, is that a fair thought? You have to say yes. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> it certainly seems that way to me, as I say in my book. <laughs> um, if he were alive today, he might never be president. He might be out in the field somewhere uh, as, as a zoologist. But I, I definitely think you know that he himself said over and over again that without Dakota, he never would have been president. You know, it started a chain of, of events. That it was North Dakota. He learned cowboys and he learned working people. As a result of that, he attracted those kind of people to the Rough Riders. He became a hero. That made him governor of New York. He was a real pain in the neck to the Republican Party, so they put him in the White House, little knowing that McKinley would be killed. And so he saw that as a, a very distinct chain of events. And he also said that uh, it was working with the people out here in North Dakota that gave him a respect um, for working people. And also it gave him an understanding that America, and he says this specifically, isn't just the Atlantic seaboard that it's, there are all kinds of Americas out there, and there are all kinds of interests and needs. So he himself, that's what that regionalism I was talking about earlier, he was able to rise above that. Um, and you know, now, you know, I suppose he could have had that same experience had he gone to Alaska or, or uh, you know. South Dakota. Yes, yeah, yeah, South Dakota. <laughs> God Certainly, forbid, the Nebraska know. Sand Hills. <laughs> but he only came here because the railroad could get him here. Right. So he could easily have wound up in Nebraska or in Wyoming or in mm -hmm. Montana. Sharon. I, Come on up. I know you have an announcement. You're going to send us off to lunch here. But I think what I hear all of you saying is, and, and Stephen, I know you're going to say something, That's but okay. the National Theater Roosevelt Center has to be in North Dakota, obviously, because of that. But <laughs> go ahead, Stephen. That's what I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. <laughs> no, what I was going to say is I, do, I agree, and um, not just because it would be unpopular to disagree, but I do agree that the, Nor the North Dakota experience was very important, very formative for him. But I think part of it wasn't just where he was, but when it was. Right. It was following the death of his young wife and his mother, really, that he spent a lot of his time out here. And I think that was a time when he was contemplating what, what is his life going to be. Remember, his father had died not that far long ago either. A point where he was contemplating really what his life was going to be about. And um, I think it was just really a period where he decided what he wanted to be and what he wanted to do. And so I think the timing of his experience out here is also important, and we should uh, consider that in making these judgments. And that this was a last sliver of frontier, too, in a nation that had, had really cl closed the frontier. Sharon. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. This has been a delightful conversation, hasn't it? <laughs>